Welcome everybody to this video in which we will be performing a test concerning the value of a single uh, variance, uh, getting to use uh, the chi-squared distribution for the first time. Um, in the next video we'll be using the F distribution, so something completely different to the student's T distribution that we've been relying on in the um, the previous couple of videos. Um, if you are not a subscriber of the Let Me Explain channel and you like this video, please do subscribe and even consider becoming a member and supporting the channel so as to get the uh, access to the full content that is on the channel. Right, let's get started with this topic. Now, something that your curriculum for some reason doesn't state, it used to say so in the past when I took these exam, is that you sh we should be implicitly assuming here. So the assumption is going to be that the sample that we are going to be re relying on is drawn from a normally distributed population. Now your curriculum doesn't necessarily say this, but that's a sort of assumption um, of the test that we're going to be performing. And let's get let's go straight to some figures. Let's do a simple um, little numerical example similar to the one uh, you'll find in the text as well. Let's say we've got a fund and that fund has a stated objective or advertised objective um, of maintaining some level of risk, um, of maintaining some level of standard deviation um, of monthly returns, let's say. Equaling 3%. Of course, it doesn't always equal percent, but that's what they want. That's what they are aiming for. A standard deviation of monthly returns of um, three percent so you know a measure of risk now data has been complied, compiled for um, the latest 31 months typically in the books it's going to be something like 24 two years um, or 36 I'm using 31 just to make uh, data accessibility easier when we look up um, the, va the critical values in the relevant table um, it has really revealed that for that 31-month 30, period, the standard deviation of the monthly returns is in fact 3.3%. Okay, so that's our sample standard deviation. Now, I want us to perform a test, go through all the steps necessary to perform a test uh, to see if the computed standard deviation that's the 3.3%, is different, you know, significantly different from um, that objective of 3% at a 5% level of significance. Now, of course, 3.3% is not the same as 3. The question is, does this give us enough evidence to conclude that the fund is not meeting its objective at a 5% level of uh, significance. Now we expect this may not be the case, right? We may expect, we expect perhaps that the standard deviation is too high, so the risk level is too high. So of course step one is to state the hypotheses, both the null hypothesis and the alternative. Now, re remember always, age zero, the null hypothesis is what we expect to be wrong or what we suspect to be wrong. So we think that the true standard deviation or the true variance, because we are going to be essentially testing variances, so already I'm going to start thinking in terms of variance, is actually equal to 3%. This is what we suspect to reject. So we suspect that this is wrong. That's why I'm writing the equal sign. And because it's variance, I'm going to square. 3% standard deviation is 3% squared um, uh, in terms of variance. So that effectively gives 0 0.0009 when you express it in decimal form. 
my alternative hypothesis is going to be that the variance of this fund is not equal to 3% squared, so not equal to 0 0.0009 when we express things in decimal form, which is what your curriculum actually does. So the null hypothesis, let's just write this down, is the, the statement that we suspect is wrong. We suspect this is wrong. We never less write it down as the null hypothesis. Okay, now step number two, identify the appropriate test statistic and the corresponding distribution. And as I said, in this video, uh, when testing um, a single variance or the value of a single variance, uh, we are going to utilize what is known as, this, uh, as the chi-squared distribution. And the test statistic that we will be utilizing over here, right, is something denoted as uh, chi-squared with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And this is equal to simply open brackets, n minus 1, which is something you've seen us do a lot of the time, uh, 1 minus the sample size, basically sample size is n. Now we multiply this by s squared. This is the variance of the sample. Um, the small case s is always sample standard deviation, so s squared is sample variance. And we divide by um, this. Uh, sigma squared, um, zero, this is the hypothesized variance of the population. Okay, now in our case, what's in the denominator, this sigma squared, so the variance of the population is basically going to be 3% squared. It comes from our null hypothesis over here. It's that 0 0.0009 or just 3% squared. Um, S squared is going to be this result, the standard deviation coming from the sample, of course, squared. So 3.3% squared. This is going to be relatively easy to compute. So you may get asked to do this in the exam actually to compute the level of the statistic. Although I expect that is not going to be the case. Probably values may be given and you'll just have to make some decision uh, given a set of critical values as well. Now, step number three, state always the level of significance. And here, the level of significance was given. So we were told do this at a 5% level of significance. So we stick to alpha being 5%. And importantly, it's going to be, again, a two-tailed test. That comes from the fact that our, our uh, null hypothesis is stated in terms of equals. The uh, alternative is not equal to. That gives us two-tailed tests always. Right, if we had greater uh, or less than signs, that would, be a one, that would give rise to a one-tailed test. The next thing is to state the decision rule. Okay, now, we wrote over here that we would be utilizing the chi-squared distribution. Let me also add that with n minus 1 df, n minus 1 degrees of freedom, n is 30. Sorry, n is 31. So degrees of freedom, it was 31 months worth of data. So 31 observations minus 1 gives 30. That is our degrees of freedom. And what I've got is a separate sheet with the chi-squared uh, distribution uh, statistical tables over here. And look at the way in which it is um, let's say, framed, presented. 
on the left hand side you do indeed have degrees of freedom and as we go down we get to uh, a row that reads 30 that's going to be the one where we will be looking at so we're potentially interested in all of this data and then it says probability in the right tail okay well let me go back uh, to my note here and draw for you the um, the shape of the chi-squared distribution because it's going to be very different to what you may be used to from our discussions of uh, students uh, t distribution this one will not be symmetrical it looks let's say something like this I intentionally didn't draw this to be symmetrical so this is the chi squared chi squared distribution and it is um, asymmetric in terms of its shape and it actually has over here a lower boundary of zero so it is bounded by zero it doesn't take on um, any negative values right unlike uh, the student's t distribution which had zero in the middle and it went symmetrically to the right into positive territory and to the left into negative right we are performing a two-tailed test and the total amount of probability that we want to be left in the tails is 5%, which means, just like before, 2.5% in each of the tails. I'm going to look for some critical values which leave over here and over here, respectively on the two sides, 2.5% probabilities which in commonly give, um, or together give 5 if I were conducting a one-tailed test, I would only be looking at one of the tails containing 5%. But I wanted to make this a two-tailed test example because of the asymmetric nature of uh, this distribution. It's a little bit more tricky. Now, let's start with the right-hand side over here. This tail containing 2.5% to the right. Let's go back to the table and focus on the fact that over here we are told probability in the right tail and because I want two and a half percent probability to be stuck in that right hand tail I'm going to be looking at this row which actually says two and a half percent or 0 0.025 and when I go down uh, sorry in this column I think I previously said row I come to a place which reads 46.979 that's going to be the first of my critical values 46.979 I also need a um, critical value on the left hand side this cutoff point over here and you kind of have to reverse engineer it if there is going to be two and a half percent probability left in the left hand uh, tail then what's to the right is going to hold 97 and a half probability percent of probability all the way to the end right into infinity so back to the table here that's the that's the column i need the column which reads 97 and a half percent probability left to the right of that critical value let's go down in this column and we get to a value at the intersection of 30 degrees of freedom and that column 16.791. Let's write that down as well, 16.791. Okay, so we've got critical values which are not the same in terms of absolute number, one with a plus, one with a minus, no. They're very different. Both are positive. 16.791 um, uh, and 46.979, okay. And our decision rule is going to be reject the null hypothesis if our computed chi-squared value, the, t the test statistic, is either 
below 16.791 or above 46.979 uh, so it's more extreme than these two critical threshold uh, values to the to the left and to the right okay the next step is to actually perform a calculation of the test statistic so this was step 4 we now move to step 5 calculate the test statistic <laughs> so let's recall chi squared with n minus de 1 degrees of freedom is n minus 1 so in our case it was let's recall 31 months worth of data that was the n we deduct 1 from this we multiply by the sample variance s squared well the standard deviation of the sample is 3.3 so let's get this down 31 minus 1 n minus 1 times 3.3 squared now you can either do this like I'm doing as percentages or you can turn this into decimal format it will not really matter because you're dividing by something expressed in the same units because in the denominator of this fraction you are going to have the um, hypothesized variance of the population uh, so uh, sigma squared um, we hypothesized that this would be 3%. And as long as I'm consistent in terms of sticking 3 over here squared, you know, the variance, uh, between the top and the bottom of the fraction, I express things either as percentages or in decimal format, it will be okay. Let's see what this gives. Um, 30, so 31 minus 1 is 30, times 3.3 squared divided by, well, essentially... 3 squared is 9, so 3 squared 9 equals 36.3. Let me just show you that if we did the same thing using decimals, we would also be okay. I would have 0 0.033, that's 3.3% uh, percent squared, times 30 equals, and divide that by 0 0.03 squared, that's my 0 0.0009, that's the variance, equals... 36.3. Okay, the relationship is stable. Now, please appreciate where that 36.3 is in terms of our depiction of the chi-square uh, chi -square distribution. It's somewhere between those two critical values. So it's in the territory where we actually fail to reject. We would be rejecting H0, uh, the null hypothesis, if we crossed out out of those boundaries exceeded the boundaries but we haven't so step number six is to make of course a decision and that decision is going to be that we fail to reject h zero we essentially if we were to express this in words cannot conclude that the recently measured uh, variance, you know, or standard deviation is different from the stated, which was, um, you know, uh, standard deviation equal to 3% or variance equaling 9% squared um, at a 1%, sorry, not a 1%, 5%, wasn't it? 5% level of significance. So that is the result put into words.